Welcome to the Epic Company Culture Podcast, where your host, Josh Sweeney, will give you, the business leaders, HR professionals, and company culture aficionados, the knowledge you need to take your company culture to the next level. Hello, fellow culturists, and welcome to the Epic Company Culture Podcast. Today's series is part of the Culture Champions. Before I get started, I would like to thank Prototype Prime for this amazing podcast space. We're going to kick it off with Dave Davis of Baker Audio Visual. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Oh, well, I'm not very interesting, so I can tell you about the company all day. But um, I've been with the company for, I guess, going on about 11 years now, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Was a musician with long hair and did a lot of, you know, uh, sketchy things, I guess, probably in the past and had a good time and uh, found myself in this world, which has been really, really cool. And uh, Baker Audio Visual has been around since 1953. So obviously I haven't been there from the beginning. Yeah. So, you, you, know, you didn't start no, it. It's I gray hair. <laughs> okay. But um, really cool history to the company, a very innovative type company, and uh, just a really cool thing to be a part of. But we're in the design build world of audio visual. Yeah, so I guess coming from being a musician to all the wires and things you have to deal with now was, you know, maybe an easy transition. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was, uh, it helped. Let's put it that way. Got right? it. Yeah, I checked out the website. I love all the visuals. I'm a cool. big fan of uh, environments. Like, you know, I come from a sales background in sure. CRM space originally, and I just love. Uh, and I worked in security operations centers and places that had lots of screens, all the data up in front of you, whether it's comparing salespeople or security incidents, uh, you know, network security incidents. Or whatever it was and you guys had a lot of beautiful imagery and, and build outs on the website right well listen we're proud of our work i mean that's a big big point for us is uh, we don't necessarily necessarily need the badge of of the client name or whatever it is it's more about the work and the product that we produce so it's really cool to have the ability to have projects that produce in that that type of imagery which is which is awesome yeah, it definitely makes marketing easy. Yeah, it makes, yeah it makes it easy. That's right. <laughs> Some things are a little less tangible. You know, sure. it's hard to grab those those images. Um, all right. So on the company culture side, we like to start mm -hmm. off with a little bit of background. So before you were at Baker, what were what were some of the cultures you worked in that left the best impression with you that you said, you know, this was an awesome experience. I want to use that in the future. Well, I, so my background is uh, pretty interesting. So I ended up wasn't a college guy. I never went to uh, went to college or, or had a degree. I was a musician, so I actually went to all the colleges. Oh, and fun. Had a different background <laughs> of learning in that that side of the world. But I worked for Lowe's Home Improvement for for a handful of years, and and worked in that atmosphere. Worked in construction fields and and those types of uh, those types of worlds. Uh, last company I was with before Baker sold construction material that had to do with shore protection that was all down on the Gulf Coast. And so I got exposed to culture in, you know, places like Louisiana and Mississippi yeah. and Alabama and just really awesome places to be. I put on probably 40 pounds by working in those areas, <laughs> right. but, you know, really, really cool places to be. But, you know, the culture for me was always I gravitated towards companies that were probably smaller. You know, they okay. were they had uh, they had the ability to allow you to have more freedom in what you did to be able to create. And that's what I figured out was that I gravitated to the people that would allow me to create. And so their their culture they established was smaller and let's attack business and grow business. And by the way, any idea you have to do that is awesome. And so those were the things that I really uh, figured out to go, okay, well, as I keep progressing and whatever I may do, I want to carry that kind of creativity with me and allow autonomy to happen in those types of things. Yeah, and it sounds like there's a trend towards this hands-on creativity, right? So, sure. you know, even in music, it's hands-on creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and then construction fields, you're in multiple construction fields. And now, you know, even with the AV, I mean, you're building out those rooms, not you specifically, but your team and your company are building those out. So there's a lot of visual, tactile kind of creativity involved across your well, history. Is. Yeah, there is. I mean, but it's the it's it's what everybody strives for, right? We're we're problem solvers. We just happen to use hardware and software to solve those problems, and we get immersed into uh, atmospheres that are super dusty and crazy yeah. to begin with, right? And have rebar everywhere, and we go, okay, how's our final product really going to fit in this mechanism to what becomes this crisp, 
clean, you know, environment that uh, that people are trying to inspire. There are people who either work in different ways or inspire their own culture or an experience for fans or whatever it may be. And so we get a hand all the way through that, which is which is awesome. Uh, and that really inspires people to create, you know, and as they get involved in every little mechanism through there, they stop and they go, well, I didn't know what I do actually affects that thing. And so it right. causes that real creativity to start happening. It's not just a widget putting it together. It's also the, what's the effect at the end? What do I do? You know, what's the atmosphere I created? Which is awesome. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one that comes to mind for that of like, what's the effect at the end is, you know, just walking into a boardroom and being able to plug up a laptop and having things come on. Sure. Right. You know, I don't know how many I've been in where nobody can figure it out and you have to call somebody in and everybody has a solution to it that right. never seems to work. So, I mean, that's a big impact to somebody else down the line. And it I is. think being aware of that's probably a, a huge part of it is. that job. Yeah. And we inspire our staff and team members to understand that. Right. Yeah. So, a lot of times we'll get somebody that sits with us and they say, well, how do you, you know, we're not a Mercedes Benz stadium. I'm like, great. Cause that one put all the gray hair on my chin. <laughs> right. So you know, you're not, but what I try to explain is that business is no less important, right? Your board meeting, your huddle meeting or whatever you're doing is no less important than what Mercedes Benz is trying to do in creating that fan experience in every event that they have uh, at the facility. It's really, it's, it's what's important to you at the moment and helps your business and your staff grow. That's, that's what we're a part of. And so we inspire all of our team members from the fabricators building the racks, from the guys shipping the material, from the guys programming, all of them, we inspire them to understand what their effect is at that end result. And that's what we see, right? And so, that really gets them thinking, well, I'm not just writing a code so that the TV turns on. I'm writing a code so that it always turns on <laughs> and that somebody always has success when they're setting up for whatever meeting. Because the last thing you want is technology getting in the way. Yeah, definitely a high impact culture for who you're implementing for and, and what, they're gonna, what their needs are going to be later. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So you've been through multiple different you know, construction related enterprises. Um, you don't have to name any names, but what was what was kind of the most toxic experience you had? What was a culture that you were in? You're like, I want to make sure I never work for a company that does that specific thing or does it that way again. Um, yeah, I won't name any names. I think that um, I think the culture you have to you have to figure out what what works for for you personally. So a culture that may be toxic for me may be great for somebody else. You know, maybe what they need. They may need more structure than, than I may need. They may need somebody who helps them understand that it's ABC every single day and that you don't have this big <laughs> canvas that you get to paint and create. So, so I noticed that certain cultures didn't work for me. Certain highly structured, uh, in the sales world, you're from the sales yeah. world, so the guys that are beating 20, 40 calls a day and that kind of world, that, that culture, didn't, didn't work for me. Right. I was more I needed the I needed more autonomy. I needed more ability to go and create my own path. And so I can't say that anybody had a wrong culture or, or a toxic type culture. Yeah. They had cultures that just didn't fit me. And so and those were it. Those were the ones that were super highly structured. Uh, what I saw in the ones that I didn't gravitate towards, I saw that um, they weren't clear in their message. They weren't clear. And on a consistent basis, not just a single, you know, here's our policy, this is what we do. They weren't clear that this is what we do, this is why we do it, here's our purpose, let me restate it every single week so somebody buys into it. So I saw that as a part of a toxic culture that can exist everywhere you go. And by the way, we have to work on ours right. every single day. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a part of it. Yeah. I like the idea around, you know, one, there's, there may not be a bad culture. They're just ones that don't fit you because Correct. I've noticed that over the years for myself, you know, uh, working for a large corporate entity that just may move a little slower, be more methodical about decisions because they have to, isn't necessarily the best space for me to move fast and be creative and innovative and a lot of the other things that I like to do. Correct. So there's a certain balance there. Um, so again, not toxic or bad in any way because no. it fits a lot of other people. It does. It does. Yeah. I think the, if I could give advice to anybody, the thing that you that you need to realize, you know, gossip's talked about a lot. Right? Gossip yeah. is a is a killer of culture, 
and that you've got to um, be able to kill that piece uh, that creates a toxic situation. Um, I don't quite see it the same way. Uh, I think that when people are talking within teams and, and in our office that it's a great thing to have that communication going on. I think that when they use things that would be considered gossip, it's because they may not be as informed. Right? They may not know the total situation and they jump to assumptions. So in our culture, that's why we try to express everything that's going on as often and as consistent as we can uh, so that we can not let assumptions get in the way and not let that tox possible toxic reality jump into our, into our way. So we look at it and say, well, if that's our perception, perception tends to be reality, right? right? We haven't disproven that yet. So, yeah. so let's change the perception. And, and that's how we try to squash that. Yeah. So just to recap on that, gossip happens and more importantly, ne probably negative or uh, gossip that's a misunderstanding, right? Mm -hmm. Not the positive, just natural progression of people talking, but like those styles of gossip, your, your thought is that that happens because the communication didn't come across either correctly or it never happened, or there's a, um, there's a better way to communicate to break down those barriers. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You Some know, sort of knowledge gap, basically. Absolutely. You know, I used to laugh. I'd say, come out of a meeting every once in a while and say, why did I say the sky was blue and they heard it was purple? Right. I don't, I don't understand what just <laughs> happened there. And it took a while for me to understand that different personalities heard things differently. And so we always have to, as leaders, we have to reinvent the way that we discuss things and the way that we say them. And we have to be repetitive, right? We, right. Have, to, we have to continue to say it uh, so that the message stays consistent and is clear. Yeah, I've always heard that if you uh, if you haven't said it so much that they're sick of hearing it, then you didn't say it enough. That's that's correct. And it sounds harsh, right. but um, it does come up again and again. You know, you Absolutely. feel like you do have to repeat those. And I think it's also part of the natural just evolution of the business. I mean, you have churn, you have people that move to different roles, you have people that work on projects for, you know, maybe three or six months. And then they come back to something you, they were doing and need that reminder. You know, there's just the general dynamics of it require that iterative, you know, Absolutely. reaffirmation of everything. It does. It does. And, and then you in our field, because you have projects that consume you and, and, you're, and you're out of the office, so you're out of the atmosphere um, and you're carrying the culture out with you in an individual basis. And hopefully you're executing that in whatever environment you're in. But you can be in that isolated environment for a while. And so when you come back yeah. in, you kind of have to be reminded, oh, this is what it was like, right? <laughs> or we've modified this or we've done this. And so um, in our world, it's, that's what it is. It's a lot of repeat and help with the clarity and, and the messaging and, and listen and learn what people are saying and, and the feedback that we get and then step back into that, you know, and figure out how to deliver the message again. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest challenge of managing lots of teams that are out of the office often on these projects? So I and clarify if I'm wrong, but sure. I imagine you have lots of different groups going out and working on projects for long periods of time to build out, you know, a boardroom or Mercedes Benz or whatever it might be, a stadium, mm -hmm. you know, they're out and about. So what's the hardest part of managing the culture with all these disparate people probably across the state or country? Sure. It's uh, the hardest thing is, is finding the time to, um, to reach out and touch them, you know, and, and to make sure from a leadership and management level that they know that you're there, right. And that you still support them. And uh, so you have to stay highly engaged. And you have to stay highly engaged, not only in the work performance, but you have to stay highly engaged in what's happening in their life. And, you know, one thing that we did, I mean, Mercedes was a daunting project. It was amazing. Love being a part of it. Would love more. You know, anybody that's listening, bring more, bring more. Stadiums. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, part of, part of what we learned in that was the sacrifice that people are willing to give. And that was what kind of reaffirmed our, our grasp of our culture. Uh, we never demanded anybody be on site to help us through the, the end of that project. We had people volunteer, and they, and they showed up, which was really cool. And as we stood back and looked at it, what we realized was that they were sacrificing a piece of their family life too. And so at the end of it, uh, part of what we wanted to do is we, we had a shindig. We invited their you know, spouses to come or significant others to come. Those that sacrifice a lot of time, we actually sent their significant others gifts and, yeah. and tokens of our appreciation just to say, we know you sacrificed to help us do this by your time and your family presence. So um, that's how we think of things. And, and so that's 
when they're out that's how we try to stay we, it's always it's never the same thing every time right. it's not a cut and dry here's what we should do in the handbook it's what's the situation how do we stay connected with them but the hardest thing back to your question is is keeping the communication going right and not stepping away and going they're on an island oh they'll be great they'll call me if there's a problem we can't do that. But yeah. You got to stay in touch. What are some ways that you like to stay in touch? Do you have certain rhythms? Do you, do you use video? Like, what are some ways that our listeners would sure. could learn from? Yeah. So we uh, we use a lot of um, UC projects, the Unified Communication okay. uh, platform, uh, mostly in Microsoft. So we'll we'll use the Skype platform currently and wherever it goes next. Yeah. Uh, we'll use that to stay in touch, and we like to encourage cameras on so that we can yeah. see see people as we as we talk to them. Uh, but it's actually the physical visit. And so the people that are not even here, they're in Carolina or in Florida or on a project somewhere else, we like to get out of our chair, get out of our office, and we go see them. We go see the site, and management's encouraged to make those trips and, and be present. Number one, you get to see what's going on, right? You get yeah. out, of, out of the office, out of the chair, and you get to go see what's going on. And then when you show up um, – uh, there's a sense of pride too when they're out there on that project. They want to show you what they did. You know, they don't want you looking at the report and looking at the time <laughs> and all that. They want they want to show you what's going on, whether it's good or bad. You know, yeah. and so there's not a rhythm. There's just a, a cause that we push to say go, go out, be in front of them, see them, know what's happening. Yeah, I'm a huge advocate of getting in front of people because mm -hmm. we've worked with construction companies, we've worked with uh, software companies, all kinds of companies. I've you know worked with many different industries in the, my background, and it's a huge difference when I work with a company where their executives go out and are always on the move checking out the work that's being done and visiting those clients. It makes an impact to the client that they show up, you know, the people that are on the project, that it was warranted, you know, enough attention for them Absolutely. to go out. Absolutely. And, you know, I've seen the opposite where I've worked in organizations where they never went on site. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, you got that project. Good. You know, I'm holding you accountable for it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of psychological impact of somebody being able to show them the work or that firsthand share of here's what we did and here's the experience and, you know, Absolutely. what does it look like? What's the finished product? It is. It is. I mean, and it's uh, for, for me, there's a recent project where uh, some people were going to dedicate their night and weekend time to get it over the hump because the construction trade was lagging behind a little bit. Uh, we went out there and, you know, me put my hands on something. I'm a sales guy, so <laughs> they don't want that to happen. It'll right. definitely break. So when I go out, um, what can I do? Well, I could go get pizza. I could bring it in. I could stay there with them. Uh, at some point, I'm carrying boxes down the freight elevator because I want them doing something that's probably a little more meaningful to get us get us over the line. Right. And uh, and so even from an executive level, that's where we're we're willing to to jump in and do. Uh, and and so you know, accountability is an interesting word because we think of it more on ownership. Uh, accountability starts to have a little bit of a negative connotation to it. Yeah. So. We want to go out and see, you know, are they taking ownership of this project? Are they really pushing it across? Are they proud of what's going on? And then they know they have our support because we showed up. Awesome. So what is your fa you know, moving? I know we've been talking a little bit about Baker and we went back in the background a little bit, but what is your favorite part of the culture? So, I mean, you get to go visit people, you get to see the work and you know, there's all kinds of aspects around the ownership. What is, if you had to pick one thing, what is your favorite part of it? Uh, it's a, that's a pretty tough challenge. I don't know that I could pick one thing. Um, you know, we did, we moved to an ESOP company here okay. recently, which I'm not sure that you're aware of or not. You can explain it. I've, I've heard of them, sure. but if you want to explain it for our listeners, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so to pick one thing, I think I'm picking the most recent thing okay. in the, yeah. uh, uh, in, in the, 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 everything that we built. Uh, so uh, we've been owned by uh, Keith Hicks, our CEO, and Joe Shook for a long, long time. I became an owner uh, four or five years ago, something like that. So it was three owners uh, of this company, and uh, we decided that uh, eventually we've got to plan out what the long-term deal is. Keith Hicks has owned it for 44-some-odd years, and uh, so he had a plan for life that he wanted to, to move down, and so we had a couple options to look at, and ESOP uh, turning the company over to our employees in this employee owned plan was was the best thing that we could possibly do. Uh, it helped us not lose any part of the culture that we feel that everybody has built. 
Uh, it helped us uh, look at a long-term game and give some people some some other advantages from a retirement uh, standpoint. And it also brought that ownership word right. really into play, you know. And for them to for them to come out and go, well, wait a minute, you're giving me stock of your company and I didn't pay anything for it. We're like, no, you're not paying. The only thing you're paying for is keep doing what you're doing. If you want to do it better, that's awesome. It'll help us. You know, the more profits go in, everybody gets to share. It was, it was that, it was that thing that got us to the next level, right? And yeah. now, now we're this. And it's talked about every single day in the office. I mean, every single day as we, you know, we've been fortunate enough to win the uh, best places to work and be in that that whole list uh, for multiple years in a row. And even currently, some of the feedback we got, it's it's about ESOP now. That's part of the discussion, and they're realizing it, which is which is uh, inspiring. Yeah, and just to clarify, that's employee stock ownership plan. Correct. Is that correct. Okay, that is, that is correct. And so that's that's a process in which over time, a big chunk of the company gets turned over, turned into stock that the employees then vest into or get over a period of time or whatever the the format is that that's you correct. agreed upon mm-hmm. uh, with the planners that that put that into place. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I could see how that could be a major change for ownership because if i want to stay nights and weekends and i actually have ownership in this private entity then that's going to have an impact later that's that's the whole nother level of ownership as opposed to well i own it because this is my job or my role Mm -hmm. um that's a a literal ownership it is a literal ownership and you're thinking about the next thing because everybody controls dollars whether it's in time or whether it's in purchasing material and and you think about the next move you're going to make and you think about you know what you have to do with your team and that increased in, in communication and uh you know am i going to pick up the phone does it matter at this point and and it's buy-in you know and it's buy-in to that ownership and that's what it that's what it created and, and so everybody everybody is grabbing onto it yeah well i think i'd love to have you back on a year from now to hear like psychologically what happened you know sure. what what kind of actions did did you see change when people actually became owners right um in an esop and and what kind of impact that's had you know in, into the future let's do it yeah that'd be phenomenal so lots of things to share um last question that i have for you biggest um biggest thing you're looking forward to enhancing so you just did the esop so that's sure. a that's a big change mm-hmm. and that sounds like it's really taken wind in in the organization uh what's the next thing that you're looking forward to enhancing from a company culture perspective so each year we come out with uh kind of the title of the year so in in 2018 it was the year of the challenge where we were going to challenge people to um to try to do more with, uh, with with what we have and, and grow the company uh, and be able to um, step in a different direction without doubling you know resources and those right. kind of things it was it was a challenge and challenge to produce even a better quality than we already think that we that we do so this year this year is the the year of development and which we want to truly develop people to the next level and that means whether it's a development into leadership or whether it's just a development further in their career path or if it's something that we can help even in life advice or however that development is. But we center around those kind of themes as we progress through the years and always have that next challenge. So what I'm very interested to do is to understand where our people are going to help us go okay. in, in this ever-evolving market that, that is really hard to put our hands around. And so that's that's – you know, it's inspiring to watch them go, okay, so how do I do that? And, and where's the next place that I can take it? Because it's them who take us. It's not me. Right. And I'm sure it's challenging because you have to get with each individual and, wa- and find out where they want to go, how do they want to be developed, and that probably is a lot of different directions for people as well. It is. It is. Yeah. Uh, you'd be amazed on how many of them are centered around the same thing, though. You really would. What What are you hearing so far? So, so far um, – Everybody talks about a career here, mm-hmm. right? And so in a day and age where people jump every couple of years from company to company, and uh, that seems to be where things go now, the days of our dads who worked for right. 30 or 4, 50 years at the same company don't necessarily exist now. And so what, what we're hearing is that they're very interested in that development and, and what we can help them see so a lot of it is they don't know necessarily what what are the possibilities. So from a leadership standpoint, we get to stand back and go, oh, hey, we get let's paint let's help them help them paint a picture. Let's show them 
where that development can go and, and where we can be to be competitive and, and to help them, even if it's they're staying forever or if they're staying for a handful of time. Yeah. So. I love it. Well, thank you for sharing all about your company culture and your background. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on the Epic Company Culture Podcast. This has been a Culture Champion Series episode with Dave Davis of Baker Audio Visual. If you'd like to hear more, follow us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. We also have all the video up on our YouTube channel at Epic Culture. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Epic Company Culture Podcast with Josh Sweeney. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. For additional content and transcripts, visit epicculture.co. If you have questions or topics you would like us to address or expand on, tweet us at epicculture1 or email at podcast at epicculture.co.